Hey there, welcome to the Game Artist Podcast. My name is Ryan Kingsline. I am the founder of the Game Art Institute, where we train artists for the career of their lives. In this podcast, we interview amazing game artists to see what makes them tick and see how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right. Hey, guys, Ryan Kingsline here. And I want to welcome Anna to this podcast, to this section, this interview with you guys, especially you guys here in the guild or here watching it live. And how long have you been streaming for Pixelogic? Since January. So yeah. Five months. That's great. I saw when that came out, I was really excited about it. I saw it grow and I saw everybody kind of chip in. And so I'm excited because this is an angle that I think is really important for my students and for artists to really get to understand about how to get themselves out there and get exposure to their work and, and to who they are and, and things of that nature. So thank you so much for being here. No problem. Thank you for having me. Uh, so why don't we start with what you do right now? So you're in a VR studio, I think, right? Yes, I am a professional tech artist. I do no, no character art whatsoever at work. <laughs> I work a lot with Unreal Engine. I have a lot of experience with VR by now and like mobile VR. Yeah. And what do you guys produce? Like, what's the goal? At this current job, we do a lot of serious experiences for training and we market those towards corporations themselves. Yeah. So uh, our clients are corporations that want to train their employees, usually in some sort of safety. You know, um, what do you do if there's a disaster or a danger in your own office mm -hmm. or in our building or whatever? A lot of my work is to virtualize clients' spaces. So that we can run their training like in their customized space. It's really interesting. I really like my job. <laughs> oh, cool. So can you run us through like an example of something that you've done recently? We do a lot of, for example, we created a run, hide, fight simulation training for in case there's a danger such as an active shooter ah. in your building. Mm -hmm. That's probably pretty useful. And so what did the people do when they get into it? So they put the VR, like the Oculus set or the Vive set on. And what's the goal then? What do the people who are watching it do? Well, there's a goal is to get them used with VR because since it is for corporations, usually the people are not super tech savvy. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> so we teach them how to do things slowly. And then the goal is to get them to be more aware of their surroundings mm -hmm. um, and get them to be more, you know, keeping an eye out and, for example, know where your exit is and always have a strategy in mind. Yeah. I think that's one of the main things we try to teach them. Okay. Platform. And do they then navigate through the building to get to the exit? Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. And But it speaks to the immersiveness, you know, of what the goal is and what the reward is. But now, how'd you get this job? Like, what did you do education-wise to get yourself there? It's like a long, winding story. Yeah. <laughs> but after I was done with college, when I was in college, I was only looking towards being a character artist. And yeah. I didn't get, like, the most optimal education, I could say. You know, like, right. it happens to a lot of game colleges or game art classes and stuff mm -hmm. and I came out of college and I was reflecting on like what has it this gotten me and I figured out that I didn't learn nearly enough tech cards or coding or blueprinting or any of that stuff and mm -hmm. I felt like that was going to hinder me in my job search since I was entry level so I was really sad about that but then I decided to do something about it and I got together with a good friend called Angel and I, three times a week, I'd go to her house and we'd teach ourselves Unreal and like material creation and all that stuff. Right. And I got my job three months after I was graduated. They found me. One of my teachers that liked my work posted my work on Facebook. And like through a contact of a contact, they found my portfolio in our station and they added me on Facebook and they were like, hey, we want to talk to you. We like your work. But also we need somebody who knows Unreal and all these other things. And I'm like, I am that person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So Facebook is not only good for long lost loves, but also careers. Good to know. It definitely is. And back uh, then, I didn't even have my own network. So it was actually through my teacher. So I yeah. think that says a lot about that's, like, impressing people. That's great. Where are, you, where are you working out of? You're two hours ahead of us, I think, right now. Yes. I am in Texas. So oh, okay. Texas. Great. Okay. So tell me about like what got you streaming? What connected you with this idea of beginning to kind of get out there and connect on Twitch? Because I, I know you've kind of gone into look, what TwitchCon and you've kind of gone quite some distance in this. It's not just streaming. Yeah, 
So I've always been attracted to the idea of streaming. I always looked up to streamers, but I didn't yeah. watch them a lot. Right. And I, it's just an idea that I had in my head since the beginning in 2017. And I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool for me to do that? But no way, I'm not good enough at ZBrush. I'm not good enough at anything. Uh-huh. Nobody's going to watch me. Yeah. You know, so it took me a good, a good while. And I had already decided. I was like, in October, I'm going to start streaming. Like, even though I was scared. Yep. And I was just like slowly preparing. And then I got the chance to go to TwitchCon for free. And I was like, oh, man, why not? I mean, I do want to start streaming. I might as well go. And while I was there, I learned that all these people that were just regular people were marketing themselves and their arts and their gaming as a business. And they had business plans. And it wasn't a mystery. It wasn't like a special magical talent that you have to make yourself grow. It's like a science. And anybody could do it if they did it with like enough passion and if they did it right. So I was like, that makes sense. So I started on the exact date I had plans to start, which was like a week after TishCon. And I was super surprised at the reception I got. Like, it was crazy. <laughs> it worked. That's awesome. What kind of reception did you get? Like, and and um, how, what, do you, what do you use to track it? Do you use views, comments, shares, followers? Like, how, what metrics do you use to track that? So the reception was, it's kind of like a humble, but it was, I had like a 19 person average on the first day. Uh-huh. Which isn't a lot, but for me, I expected like three, which was like my mom and my dad and my sister. Right. Totally. So I started and I found out that like th- this was a community building tool, not just like a show off yourself tool. Yeah. And uh, I track it via the most important number right now for me is concurrence viewership, which is how many people watch at a time on average per stream. And uh, the other way I thought I personally track my followers, even though that's probably one of the most useless numbers in streaming, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I track it because, you know, right now I'm small, so I, I got to cling to whatever I have. Right. So, yeah. The most important is the, how many people watch at a time on average. Okay. Got it. Cool. And so one of the things that I think stops everybody, which is really cool that you got over it right there at the beginning is this, I, what I call the expert syndrome. I'm not good enough. You know, who's going to watch me? I have to learn X, Y, and Z. Because you must have been thinking, you know, they're going to look at my work. And what were some of the thoughts going through your head, actually? I'll ask you. (laughs) I was very insecure. I thought I wasn't fast enough. And that was true, actually. I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't good enough. Nobody was going to like my art. Why would anybody watch me? Because I know Rafael Grisetti, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Why? I'm just like a girl who's been doing this for three years. Like... I, why would anybody, like, that was one of the big ones, like, why would anybody waste their time? Right. And and little things like that. But I guess, yeah, those are my main insecurities right there. What turned the tide? How'd you get over that? Well, it's funny. I was working on my mindset because I, during college, I got burnt out and I got depressed, right? Yeah. And for like a good six months before I started streaming, I was just like working on positivity and and believing in myself and like being confident and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I hadn't got quite gotten there yet, but I came, I read this quote. It's super, it's, it's, it's not hilarious. Uh, I read this quote and it said, don't focus on making your life perfect, but add nice things. And eventually you'll have a pile of nice things in your life. Nice. And that's like a paraphrasing. But then I realized, you know, why am I waiting till I'm like a really good artist or why am I waiting until I'm that and this and that and famous or whatever? Mm-hmm. Start streaming. I'll start now and I'll just keep adding nice things as I go. Yeah. And I figured I'd have like a humble start and grow instead of just waiting because waiting doesn't do any good for anybody. So that was the the tides change that I still didn't like necessarily like feel that I was ready or anything, but I had to do it anyway. Got it. Now, one of the things that I think kind of screws us up to in this, this idea that, you know, we have to be experts is that we do have to show off and we do have to be that person. I'm that artist. I'm, I'm Raphael Grissetti. But you mentioned, you know, that as you've gone through this, you've learned it's not about showing off. It's about community. Yes. So how does that show itself? Like, how does that manifest? Because, you know, you are showing off you know, quote unquote, so to speak, you know, we get on and we do something and we're showing our work and we're working through problems. You know, how's the community figure into this? So the community, in a way, they're going through a lot of the same struggles that we are. Mm -hmm. Either that or they have already gone through it. So I think for them, it's a good thing to see you being vulnerable. 
I think vulnerability is where like it comes all in. You know, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. And we figure it out together. Sometimes I use my community and I'm like, hey, you guys know this answer, you know, this talents, please send me tutorials, all that stuff, because I don't know everything. And yeah. I think that kind of helps build the community and it's beneficial for them. And for me, they see, you know, a lot of them are uh, less experienced than me. Not all of them, but like a lot of them are starting college now or a lot of them are still in high school. And, you know, they might be intimidated by some person who already knows everything. But if you are like calm and you show them that problem solving is a part of this and that you need to keep calm and just work and not look good all the time, I think it helps them and it helps you too. Right. How do you deal with the haters? Uh, we ban them. <laughs> you what? Ban them. Oh, yeah. Right. I, we have low tolerance in my channel. Depends on the hater. I get a lot of sexist comments and I get a lot of... Um, yeah. Those are automatic bans. But I do get a lot of backseat art directors. I um, <laughs> love that. <laughs> <laughs> I have two categories. I have backseat artists and backseat art directors. Okay. The backseat, the backseat artist is like, the anatomy looks wrong. And that's a helpful comment. It's constructive criticism. Whereas the backseat art director is like, the hair should be purple, not green, which is just an opinion. And I'm like, are you my art director? I didn't realize you hired me. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my paycheck? <laughs> what about any of those backseat tech artists? Oh, you could do this or, oh, you should have done that. Or, oh, it's done this way is the proper way. Oh, um, I think those are probably one of the most useful ones because yeah. I don't always follow their advice, but I like to learn from them because mm -hmm. they might know something better than me. I have this one guy on my stream that knows everything there is to know about ZBrush. Great. And like, he should be the one streaming, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he helps so much. And so like, we listen to that guy. He tells me like, use that other two. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> a little bit embarrassed, <laughs> but <laughs> I embarrass myself a lot. And that's part of it. Like, you just have to get over that fear. That's great. You know, and I'm actually starting now to talk to the bootcamp members about this idea of, you know, how they get themselves out and some of the ways that I learned. And uh, I think we started our business at about 2010, I think it was. And one of the people out there that was talking about how you teach online or you communicate online, his name's Jeff Walker, and he developed this thing called the product launch. And uh, he had this motto of kind of the reluctant hero. So you're the reluctant expert, so to speak, which means, you know, I suffered all of this stuff. So now I'm just trying to share my journey with you. I'm not like, you know, the hero that knows everything. I'm just, you know, I suffered. I'm sharing the journey. Come along with me. Let's go. Does that resonate with you in terms of, you know, how you think about connecting with people? Yes, I actually think that's a great way because... I think that the thing that comes to mind is that when you humble yourself, people will try to lift you up. But mm -hmm. when you like show off yourself, people will try to humble you. And so like, it's good to, I, like my, my job is to help them and to share with them my struggles so that they don't do it again, you know? Yeah. And lots of mistakes that they could maybe not make themselves. Yeah. So I definitely, that, definitely agree with that like mindset. I love the way you say that though. If you humble yourself, people try to lift you up. So you bring them into your journey. Mm -hmm. as opposed to them trying to, you know, having that feeling that, you know, they might need to take you down a peg. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, so what about really tenacious people, you know, that maybe you ban from one platform and they come back on another and, and things like that? Do you ever have that problem? I can't totally recognize everybody because everybody has different usernames yeah. on different platforms. But I did have a problem with this one lady that was giving me hate. Turns out I was talking to her boyfriend, even though he was another artist. Ah. Um, and we were just talking about art. And she was like going crazy on me on all these different platforms. Ah. Um, but that was like the most... And it, it doesn't bother me. I could tell it was personal, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, um, so. that's awesome. That's a great perspective. So then, you know, if you don't mind, I'd love to take a second and talk a little bit about, about being a woman in this industry. You know, and I know that's a loaded conversation, but it's, you know, it's, I mean, the percentage of women in this industry is incredibly low. Yeah, it is. It really is. So why don't we start with this? Like, what got you into the, into this that you think, you know, might connect with other uh, women, you know, because we have women here on this and, and Charlotte's in here, uh, Alyssa's in here, you know, so we have people coming through here in this boot camp, you know. 
what got you into this in your unique way? Into game art or into streaming or both? G- game art specifically. Okay. So I've always been an artist and yeah. it just came down to what kind of art I wanted to do. Yeah. I wanted to go into fashion at first, but my dad said I was really bad at dressing, so I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Great dad. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a few years went by, and I, I was on uh, DeviantArt, or D- DeviantArt. And, yeah. Um, and I started seeing, like, I started noticing. I put two and two together, and I realized that a lot of the artists that I was the most into mm-hmm. were being concept artists. Mm. And I was a 2D artist uh, until I was, like, nine, 20, 19. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, the world of gaming. I had never thought about it, but it made sense. I was a gamer, but I didn't, I didn't even think about it. Mm. And so I went into that field. I never, ever thought twice about it because I was a girl or not. It didn't matter at all for me. Like, the fact that I was a girl never came into play for any of my career choices ever. Yeah. Some people think it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. What do you think has really served you well? as a woman in this industry, like what kind of attitude or mindset do you think has really just helped you kind of, you know, take the high road, keep going, deal with, you know, the, just the differences. Cause it's not really about, you know, people trying to tear you down. It's just, you know, men and women tend to be different too. So. Well, I don't really know. To be honest, I, I haven't planned my plan of attack by being a girl. Um, mm-hmm. I know that it, it, they say it helps for my social media, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I really don't. Well, it strikes me that you, you know, you just take a rational tone to things. You know, you don't get emotional. You're just, you know, here having fun. And I think that you're approaching this from a very humble perspective, which is just really refreshing. You know, you're not out there to be the top dog or anything like that. You're just out there to share and communicate. Yes. Which is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, what has this done for you in terms of your career? What has social media done? Oh, so much <laughs> already. Yeah. yeah, tell me. Okay, so it was around October when I started putting any effort into this. Uh-huh. So I've been at it for like eight, eight, sorry, seven months. Six mm-hmm. or seven months. And um, it, it's already helped because, for example, at the first four months of streaming, I was getting freelance offers all the time. Oh, great. A lot of them, a lot of them weren't paying. Like they were, they were trying to give me to her for free. So it doesn't count. But at the very least, I got to like school some people on what not to do. Mm-hmm. Don't work for free. But um, I started getting more freelance offers. I got started getting more contacts from people that I really admired for years. Mm. You know? Yeah. Little things started to happen like that made me so happy. Like some artists that I've been following for years followed me on Instagram randomly. I'm like, oh my God, what did I do to deserve this? It must have been a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Did they click the follow button on accident? <laughs> um, so I'm not looking for to change my career yet uh, or anything like that. I'm really happy where I am, but just the contacts that I've been getting, the, the experiences. And then, of course, I got to work with Pixelogic or stream for them. And that was probably one of the biggest jumps, biggest opportunities I've gotten yet. Mm-hmm. And it's been fantastic. I think that one kind of... So I, I'm still kind of like a beginner you know like i've been doing this for four years now and i'm still finding my footing and working with Pixelogic to do the streams gave me a lot of street cred in a way yeah so that yeah that's true they're like an instant validator Mm -hmm. i experienced that in my own career you know working with a company like that and so that kind of brings me to one of the things to talk about which is i'm sure they talked about this or at least you know it seems to be part of the conversation but partnership and the way on Twitch that you work with another channel or you stream for another channel, there seems to be this like interconnection between channels. Mm-hmm. So what's that like working with partners? Is Pixelogic the only partner? Do you actually go out and connect with other people on their streams? You know, what I'm really looking for is what's this community of streamers like, you know, that are all connected together? So Pixelogic is my only official partner of anything. Mm-hmm. But... There's a bunch of ways for you to kind of help lift other streamers up and right. get lifted up, yeah. um, such as like rating and hosting, which hosting is when you show them off on your channel when you're offline and mm-hmm. ratings when you take all the people that are watching you and you all visit their stream uh, when you're done. What's that called again? Um, rating. Rating. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a really great tool. Basically, say you're done and you have like 40 watchers, you mm-hmm. can send them all and you can go together to somebody else's stream and now they'll have plus 40 followers or 40 watchers. Nice. Cool. 
I only dabble in positive communities. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's no room for anything else. So I'm always trying to lift other artists up as much as I can. And I only hang out or talk to or to host or whatever people that are positive and are doing the same for other arts. And it really, it's one of the things that I like the most about Twitch, to be honest. The communities are so welcoming in creative and in 3D. Like, you wouldn't believe it. It's like making best friends every day. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Before I started streaming, I would visit random people's, like, art channels and talk to them and ask them about streaming. And they were all so nice. And they still are amazing. That's great. Who are some of the people that you follow? Like if, right now, if you were to say like, there's one person that we should all check out on Twitch. Uh, just one second, because I unplugged my headphone. <laughs> yep. Yep. Testing. There he goes. All right. So I was asking about, you know, if there's one person that everybody here should know about, like who's somebody that you follow that you believe really deserves some recognition on Twitch? So this person is very popular. Yep. Ashley Adams is probably one of my like favorites. Hmm. She works. She also does Pixel Logic. Yeah. Every week, I feel like. Yeah. And she's like a master. She she can make anything from a, a sphere in like an hour. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. What else do you like about the thread? Like, and what I'm getting at here is streaming has a lot to do with personality, right? And you know, people that are considering streaming, there's that awkwardness at first getting on camera in any capacity. So you know. What is the things that you, you kind of enjoy about Ashley, about the way that she goes about doing things? Well, she's very laid back. Mm-hmm. And like her stream is relaxed and she doesn't seem nervous. I don't know if she is. She doesn't seem it though. Yeah. And like her community is also very tight and we share a lot of the community members. Yeah. And, you know, it just seems like a, a bunch of friends all together just hanging out. I think right. that's, and it, and she's super fast. Like I'm every day. I think like, oh my god, she's so fast. How <laughs> is she a witch? <laughs> so, what do you mean by you share community? How do you know who is your community or how that works? So, the people who interact with me right now, I'm at a, I'm still a small streamer, so I have them all memorized, and I know who which one is and mm-hmm. what, when the last time they came in. So, whenever I go to her stream or she rates me or I rate her or whatever. I see a lot of the similar people that are there already. Got it. Yeah. That makes sense. So have you got any job offers out of this other than freelance, but job, actual job offers or anything of that nature? Nothing interesting yet. <laughs> um, I think I've gotten like a couple of like startup job offers mm-hmm. that I've refused. Because the pay was... Nothing interesting. Oh, I'm not looking to change right now. So I'm just like, you know, Maybe Blizzard called, but <laughs> right, <laughs> absolutely, or DreamWorks, you know, oh, yeah, those, yeah, fair enough, uh, <laughs> good deal. Okay, so what would your advice be if we were going to start out? Because you're on Twitch, you're on Instagram. Do you have a Facebook page, or do you just have like a f- normal profile? I have a Facebook page that I don't use. Okay. I have Twitter as well. <laughs> In Twitter, so what? Twitter's really interesting. I've got some students. They're just out and graduated, what should they do to start to get themselves more exposure and, and just to really join the community or create a community? Or Okay, so I think the most important thing, let's say you're trying to create a community on any of those social medias or mm-hmm. Twitch. Yeah. We think a lot about what we can get, like, oh, I want 2,000 followers or mm-hmm. this and that. But the most you can get out of it is to give so, like, the more help you give, the more nice comments you give, the more positivity you spread around, it will come back faster. Mm. So, like, if you are interested in that, like, in growing, you know, like, first make sure you're being nice and you're being consistent on there and you're showing up your work. But it's almost like you are a service to people. Yeah. And it's hard to explain it. They will come. People will come if you've got something to offer. That's great. I really love this one concept that Guy Vaynerchuk talks about. It's his uh, $1.80 theory. And the basic idea is that every day you go on to 10 different profiles or pages or accounts on Instagram and you leave your two cents worth, you know, valuable contribution. You know, you give something to somebody, you comment on their post on what they're talking about. And you do that, you know, to 10 of them a day. And at the end of the week, you know, the way things add up, you end up with so much more because you're giving, 
right? And, and this yeah. industry is really built, if you give, you get. Yes. So that's really great. Now, how does somebody know if they're giving? And, you know, it's like, okay, it takes a week and nobody started to like or nobody started to follow my account. What's some of the things that somebody should think about in terms of, you know, how they should judge success or not? Because I, you know, I understand that you want to give, but there's this tendency for us to kind of check back and say, like, is this successful? I have to get a job. I need exposure. You know, like, you know, before you had your job, you're probably calculating all these different ways, you know, and there was some urgency to it. Hmm. I think uh, you would think about your own velocity, like if you were doing like an agile development, <laughs> like. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you, basically, velocity is when you have to work for a little bit before you can notice your patterns and your trends. Okay. And I don't think you'd know if you're successful in the in, right away. But let's say I do the 180 thing. Yeah. For six months, and I realized that in the first week I got four followers, and in the last week I got like 400. I think that's one of the ways you can measure. Yeah. But the way I measure mine is just for checking trends. Like I, I write down how much the progress was for that week. And then I check back and I see like, oh, how long did it take me for me to jump from this number to this number as opposed to this other number to this other number. Right. And is that like something that you do regularly or you just let this go organically? I do it regularly. I take good care of the numbers almost to like, I could tell you everything about every stream I've ever done because I have a spreadsheet. Really? Yeah. That's great. What's the benefit of that? Because I imagine there's a specific reason you're doing this. Yes, I do. I do have my, my, my specific reason. So I take meticulous notes, not notes, but meticulous um, notes taking. I, I don't know. Uh-huh. I Basically, I keep track of my own analytics. Yeah. And I keep it. A lot of websites do that, but I don't think any a website works as well as just having a good old spreadsheet. And mm-hmm. I keep track of velocity, basically, and I keep track of growth and What's it like? Oh, this stream got me 30 new viewers, and this one got me two. What did I do wrong? You know, yeah, what did I do right for the other one? I know things like which days to post on Instagram, what hours, or what days are the worst for streaming, little things like that. And it's very, very beneficial. I think that if you're trying to grow, you need to, you need to keep track and study. That's interesting. So one of the things that somebody might start feeling in the beginning is, you know, like I'm not getting enough attention. I'm not sure if this is working out. And your solution, it sounds like to that is, you know, just gather your data. Don't make your decisions, yeah. just gather your data. Yes. And, and have patience and keep going because you won't know right away. Right. Yeah, totally. You know, and, and I know this from my own experience, you know, these things take time to build. I mean, in terms of Facebook advertising, you always, there's a cost per, you know, connection or cost per result, depending on what your result is, if you're looking to connect with profiles or something of that nature, you know, and, and it always takes time. Like Facebook will take a week to learn the um, patterns for an ad, and then it'll actually start to speed up and it'll start to connect with more people that really, you know, enjoy it as opposed to just shotgunning it everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So data is key. That's interesting that you track each of these. How do you sit down and start to think about, okay, so maybe I should change this or maybe I should change that? Is there some mechanics that you can kind of share with us that can help, you know, us diagnose if we're doing something right or wrong? Yeah. Well, the first thing I used to diagnose to see, it's the numbers. Yes. Um, The numbers tell all. Uh And then the first thing, like, for example, for streaming is to listen to feedback. People will let you know if something is wrong. (laughs) They will. Yeah. And the thing that you have to do is experiments. You're going to have to dabble in a lot of different strategies. Yes. And you're going to have to like keep track of the results of each one and which one to keep going and which one to stop. If you are looking to grow, I recommend not trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a million people out there who have done a great job. Just read their books or watch their videos or something like you will find answers out there. Yeah. Is there someone you can recommend to us for Twitch um, specifically? Because that's one of the hard ones to find info on. Instagram's pretty well covered. Facebook's, you know, beating a dead horse. <laughs> so for YouTube, I legit just looked it up on YouTube or yeah. Twitch. I looked it up on YouTube, actually. Uh-huh. And let me, I'm going to just look it up real quick again and tell you guys which one was the one that helped the most. How, how to start on Twitch. 
It was a girl with brown hair and blonde streaks. There she is. I guess I recommend this video first. How to grow on Twitch tips and tricks for new broadcasters. Awesome. I Meg Keeley. That one helps. And then I, of course, watched a million other ones and picked up tips from like a million different sources. And by the time I started, I was ready. That's great. If there was two things that people need to make sure that they do from the beginning to help them get off to a good start, what are two or three things that somebody needs to really do? Okay, so at first you need to work with your social media to get any sort of awareness uh, that you're about to start streaming. Yeah. So basically, if you don't, you'll be streaming to like a black void. Right. <laughs> um so make sure you uh post on for example i did a twitter countdown every single day for a week i posted i'm starting streaming in 10 days and i had like only like 30 active twitter followers at the time yeah i I did it anyway yeah and then i kept doing that and then whenever the day comes by the way this is a very important tip i think Mm -hmm. is to invite your friends and family yeah because of the second tip that is to always be talking you can never really shut up if you're streaming. Really? Like no. never just like go into artist zone mode and just be like, oh, look, you know, figuring out anatomy or something like that. I go into that mode and then I snap out after like a minute because like when people click on your stream, they choose in like three to five seconds whether or not they want to watch. And okay. if you're silenced, your chances go down so right. much of anybody staying. Yes. You need to be like engaging the audience 100% all the time. It gets tiring, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how do you keep that conversation going? So if you at the, at the very beginning, if you invite your friends and family, you'll be fine because you'll have people to talk to, right? Ah, great point. That's why. Yeah, that's why you want your families and friends. Plus, they will add view counts, which is the way to find get found on Twitch is via the view count. At a, so um, the more people watching you at a time, at, at that specific moment, will put you up higher on a list yeah. of other streamers doing whatever category you're in. Right. So that matters. And um, so have your friends, like, I know a lot of beginner streamers have like friends or boyfriends or whatever Skype in with them so they can just talk back and forth uh-huh. in an easy way. Okay. Little I things that. like that. Like, yeah, a support group would help. Uh, <laughs> at least one friend to talk to you. Okay. Got it. That makes a ton of sense to always be having something happening. I think, what is it? Jim, is it Jim Lee? I was watching one of his just the other day. Jim Lee. Twitch. Yes, the uh, DC guy. And uh, he just had always had running commentary with his members. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. But he likes to do it at like four o'clock in the morning, (laughs) which is a little nuts. All right. Okay, so those are great tips. Now, let me start opening this up for questions, guys, and get a sense of things. But if you don't mind, Anna, I'd love to chat with you for a second about Instagram because you managed to build up your Instagram. I know Instagram's a, it's hard now, you know, like three years ago, it was like crack. I mean, it just was, (laughs) it was crazy. But do you do much on Instagram to get yourself out there? Yeah, Instagram is probably my second main tool, which is the first. Okay. Nowadays with the algorithm, it's harder to navigate, but it's still possible. Great. Um, So my tips for Instagram, that what I did for growth was, again, I watched a ton of videos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was the first thing, read about it. Um, Don't reinvent the wheel. There are ways out there and strategies already built. Yeah. And I use a ton of hashtags. (laughs) Every time I go live, I tag Twitch and Twitch Creative. I bet they know me by now because I tag every week, like three times a week. Mm -hmm. And the most important one that everybody always talks about is to be consistent. So I try to post art three times a week at the very least. And that really helps. Ever since I started doing that, like there was no other trick. Like that one was when I started to grow. Plus, I was using my Twitch to send people over to Instagram. So whenever people are watching, I want some of you in a while will be like, hey, guys, I have Instagram, by the way. And they'll be like, cool. Hmm, interesting. Do you just go over to Instagram on the, on the web browser or do you post it in comments? or? We have bots on Twitch a lot. Ah, tell me about the bots. That's actually one of the most fascinating things for me because I've seen that operational and it, it'll come in certain points to send links or even offer products, I've noticed. Yeah. So the bots are actually like fascinating yet super simple, most of them, yeah. unless you build your own. I use one called Moobot, which is free. What is it? Sorry. Moobots. Like Can- Moo isn't like a cow. <laughs> oh, Moobots. Do they have a website? 
Yeah. Twitch that move out that TV actually. There it we go. It has a bunch of my stuff in there. <laughs> and basically, you allow your community to type in commands that will trigger Mubot to do something, or Mubot can be on a timer. Okay. So um, my social media shows up every half an hour. Yeah. And Mubot will just post all my links there and Discord also every half an hour. And yeah, we use bots. We also use them. Um, I have a little overlay. Let's probably give us that. So like, here's like my handle and my, hey, uh, it's so awkward. Yes. And my um, art station right there. I okay. Know. So like I put it up, I make it visible. Yeah. And do you do this? Um, was it, was it awkward in that you're looking at yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I totally get that. Whenever I'm editing myself, it's just like, uh Yeah. Same. Like sometimes you have to rewatch yourself so you can critique yourself. And I'm like, Oh no. I know, or I have to listen, and and then now now I'm at the point where I'm listening for tone, and do I lift the pitch there, or do I lower the pitch there, and then that affects whether or not I'm making something happy, or or if I'm like a moody artist. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you use for streaming? Wirecast, OB, OBD, OBS, OBS. MPD, whatever that is. I use um, OBS, but I use it checks for updates every time. There's a thing called Streamlabs out there. It's a tool for streamers. Okay. It helps with your notifications and stuff. Yeah. And um, they have their own OBS, which is the same exact thing as other OBS. And this is super simple. It's just called Streamlabs OBS. I recommend it. Okay, I got it. So Streamlabs OBS, and it's just a lighter version of it, more specific. Yeah, it's super, it's it's more, I don't know, friend, it's friendlier. <laughs> Yeah. And what about the camera setups? Do you just use like the normal wire webcam that the camera comes with or do you have some Logitech setup? Yeah, I have a Logitech 922 or something like that. Yeah, not the 920, but you have the 922? Yeah. That's the one that has the uh, background removal, I think? Yeah, it does, although I don't use it. Okay. All right. I've seen people using that. Do you see any value in doing that or is it just whatever? Thinking at the background? Yeah. Um, I think th the value is that you can take up less space on the screen. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> that was my, that's from my point of view. Okay. So that was a Logitech uh, 922, I think. Am I wrong? Yes. Mm, yeah, that's it. Okay. It has some letters before that, but if you look that up, you'll find it. Okay, good. All right. So let me get some questions from you guys. Monica is asking a question. Uh, I have people email me on Insta for service for attracting more followers in exchange for money, basically buying followers. Got any thoughts on that? Yeah. So you want your followers to be engaged and to be interested in you as an artist and as a person. Right. It's not just a number. Like you can have a thousand followers and only 20 of them care about you. Then like it's like having 20 followers, you know? Totally. Uh, and the any followers you buy are going to be super disinterested, basically like maybe like hacked accounts or even bot accounts. Mm -hmm. So I think all those are just a trap, you know, I get those all the time. And I think those are just people trying to make money off somewhere. Totally. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would agree. You know, I think there are some places on Fiverr you can buy even Facebook likes and then you get a bunch of likes from Turkey or someplace uh, mm -hmm. or Egypt. And, um, you know, they'll they'll have like whole groups of people that'll help or bots and things of that nature. But, you know, if you have 20 engaged followers, you only have 20 followers. Yeah. So that's great advice. Isaac is asking, what's better to post on Instagram? Videos, images? And then I'd add, are you using stories or anything of that nature? Yeah, I think stories um, are very important because with the algorithm, your followers might not ever see your post. But stories are always going to be there in order, like in, in timely order. Yeah. That's a good point. So, uh, yeah. So I use those, especially when I'm going live, mm -hmm. like, because they might not see my post in time. They might see my post like 18 hours from now when I'm not live anymore. Right. So stories are useful. Use those. Use them and abuse them. <laughs> I think you should post both videos and images. Images, I don't know. I don't know which one's more beneficial, but I think you can definitely stretch out a piece of content by posting both. Let's say you have a character model you made. You might as well like have two posts, one that's a picture and one that's a video, just so that you can consistently post throughout the week mm -hmm. without having to like rush to make something new, you know? Got it. 
Okay, and then uh, Joseph, Joseph's wanting to know about your monitors. What kind of monitors do you have? Oh. Um, I have two 4K monitors. One's from Asus and one's from Samsung. They don't match. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just kind of went with whatever was on sale at the time. <laughs> that's, that's how I buy my TVs. Adam's asking, do you use Twitch Prime? I don't. I wish I did. I should, but I don't. Oh, great. And uh, Charlotte is asking, um, I'll just read the whole thing. I'm sorry, my question isn't about today's topic. I hope it's okay. I work in a startup in France specializing in VR. We started to do the same kind of stuff you described earlier in Unreal, doing security training. But I uh, should like to know if it's okay to ask you a few questions later on about your job. Is there any question you can ask right now, Charlotte? You might be worried about some technical stuff and things like that, but don't worry. If she can't share, she can't share. It's, it's not a big worry. She'll let I you can know. probably share about my own rules, not the, the experience itself. It yeah. Fine. Yeah. So go ahead and uh, shoot the questions. And I don't mind, we don't, we don't shy away from technical here, Charlotte. We get into it. <laughs> I, know, I, I know today I, I wanted I really wanted to talk social with Anna and I, and that's just maybe twenty percent of her you know she's z brushing she's doing unreal she's in VR you even said you're doing blueprints and there's some elements of that kind of coding that you're dealing mm -hmm. with in unreal you know that's a massive skill set so I just want to be clear that my goal here today was really just you know start to understand how you guys can get some exposure and how it works from there and then and then go from there. But we're listening to and talking to and, you know, a very skilled artist. So feel free to throw some technical stuff in. Let's see. Monitors we got. All right. So Charlotte's talking about how do you handle the fact that the user is in a bigger place in VR than in the real world? Does that question make sense to you? I can think of like three different things she meant with the question. Okay. So the fact that the user's bigger, in a bigger place in VR than in real life. Oh, man, like they're the same size, but the place itself is bigger. Or maybe that they have a small footprint to move around in like five, six, seven, no, nine feet, mm -hmm. nine feet squared should be about 12 feet squared. And then uh, and then they're dealing with something. She's saying uh, we try teleportation to move users, but a lot of users don't handle teleportation. So it's really how do you handle users moving through space? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we do teleportation too. We have to keep it very, very, very simple because, you know, we never know who's going to be trying out our product. Right. And there are a bunch of rules in VR about basically like player safety and player comfort. Yes. Uh, for example, if you teleport, but you move the camera, you're going to probably cause them to be sick. You have to do like a spontaneous, like instantaneous teleportation with like a fade to black or something like that okay it should be pretty simple it's very standard to do teleportation i know that we have this problem where every time we start doing teleportation that we, we use the vibe by the way um mm -hmm. the trackpad it rotates you in whatever direction your thumb is on and it's really annoying and people are get really lost and like they don't handle that well, so we just disable that. Maybe that's something you're running into because it's part of the default mm -hmm. uh, for teleportation. So yeah, I'd have to see how they're doing the teleportation to be able to, to say better because we use pretty standard stuff. And it, people people handle it pretty well after like a couple of tries. Got it. So teleportation and then navigation, I imagine like one of my students in the VR bootcamp just used, I mean, you just, you just traveled. You just used uh, your controllers and oculus and you just had a joystick and you moved through space and turned left turned right that seemed to work pretty decent you know i didn't have too many problems watching that but do you do much of that navigation or do you rely mostly on teleportation we don't because it was one of the hardest things to get through in vr yes but i have tried experiences where they navigate and there are rules for that as well um, right and i could go all day things like you can only use what do you call it like standard what do you call it? Just it has to do with acceleration. Acceleration has to be the exact same no matter what. You can't like ease in and out. Adding a nose mesh will help. Adding in the vignettes will help. Mm. Nice. Okay, great. All right. So one more question from one of the users. Then I got one question I'd love to ask you. Joseph was asking about your computer specs, and now I understand what he was asking. And I have this experience too. When I broadcast and I use the computer at the same time, like I'm especially ZBrush, which can be resource intensive in terms of the processor and RAM. 
do you have a separate computer that broadcasts? Do you have it all on one? Is there something special that you've had to do to adjust to be able to stream well? Yeah, there have been some things that I had to do. So my computer is uh, my like workhorse power computer for work work and yeah. for streaming. So I built my computer last year and I kind of went all out. Okay. And I spent a lot of money building something that I knew would handle everything I threw at it. Right. So that helps. <laughs> but also little things like I couldn't stream properly until I got like a 50 foot long Ethernet cable connected directly to the modem, for example. Right. No wireless. Uh, no wireless at all, because that's just too unreliable. Mm-hmm. For a while there, I had to do a speed test before every stream. There are ways. So like one of the problems you guys might be running into is in actual streaming settings themselves. Things like bit rates and the stream size, for example, I have to stream at 720 right. as opposed to like 1080, which I would like to do. Yes, yeah. Because that all those things help with um, my computer being able to handle it. Some softwares do take a toll on the, on the stream. I, one time I was in Pixelogic, I had just started, I was like my third or fourth stream on there. And I wanted to do a demo where I would bring this, the ZBrush model into Unreal. And when I opened up Unreal, the stream, like the frame rate went to like one every five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. So I had to fix that problem. It's a lot of trial and error, but I think with the adjusting the settings, you'll get very far because that's all I had to do, just the settings. Okay, got it. So just lower what you're pushing out. Don't push out yeah. your 10K. Because like, for example, if we just bought a TriCaster and TriCasters are not cheap, but they're basically super specialized computers for this kind of stuff. So it pushes out to Facebook, it'll push out to Twitch, it'll push out to YouTube, and it'll do Facebook at 720, YouTube at 1080. It'll record as well, mm-hmm. but it, it's a beefy machine. It's like several thousand dollars. It's a lot. Yeah, that's kind of how mine is. I stream to like all those things with when I do Pixelogic, mm-hmm. and I record all the streams too. Have you ever used Restream? Yeah, that's what we use for Pixelogic. Okay, good. So with Pixelogic, you're going out to the Restream is your output. And then are you also going out to your own Twitch or YouTube or something else? I only stream out to Pixelogic whenever I'm doing that. Okay, so you've got one output that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And a recording, I imagine? Yeah. Got it. And uh, any advice for the people that are just finishing up their boot camps or just getting their portfolio together and they're now looking for that job? Yeah, I guess I'll tell you guys something I learned through this last two years, which was me finishing college and me getting a job and starting social media. Yeah. Always think about your brand. I read up a lot on branding and Mm -hmm. we all have a brand, even if you don't necessarily brand yourself. Your brand is basically like people's conception of who you are. Right. And it works like for us person, uh, just like people. And always be analyzing your brand and try to have the self-awareness to, um, to see where, what you're doing and how you're being perceived. Mm-hmm. For example, in college, I was one of the, like, I don't want to like come across on CD or anything, but I was definitely one of the hardest workers there. And that earned me the respect of my instructors, mm-hmm. which again, like it was because my instructor posted my work on Facebook that I got this job. and then. I came out and I wanted to try to help people. And, you know, your brand is how you act on a daily basis. Like, be nice to people. Don't leave mean comments. Don't pick fights or, you know, have any outward, like, public bad opinion or, like, you know, aggressive opinions publicly or whatever. Yeah. Be careful in what you're putting out there, both in real life and in social media and in Twitch. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, your advice, and for helping us deep dive into this. Because I think the Twitch is really one of the key components for social media. Facebook's, I mean, it's it's old, but it's Mm -hmm. powerful. But, you know, this seems to be one of the ways. And tell me if you agree, but this seems to be one of the ways for somebody getting out to really start to really share who they are with as much people as possible. It was for me. That's for sure. (laughs) Awesome. All right, Anna, thank you so much. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for having me. This is fun. Great. And you guys know where to find her. So head over to Twitch and you can follow her there. You can see it all from the page. Banana Carolina underscore art. And we'll put a link in this 
um, once we post it up there, we'll put a direct link to hers. So make sure you head over there, follow her, and then you can stay up to date on all of that stuff and, um, and engage in the chat and good stuff. All right. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Nice to meet you, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Take care. See you. Bye. Bye. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time, and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This This is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch, But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. Take care. Have an amazing day.